Okay, hello everybody. This is Mike here again. So uh, today I'm going to interview Linton Joseph about Ross, and I think he's a perfect person to talk about what what Ross is. And so Linton, kind of jump in, kind of introduce yourself to the audience because some people may not know you who you are and, and your background and what you're doing. Yes, of course. Uh, first, first of all, thanks for calling me to this interview and. Uh, Hey guys, my name is Linton Joseph and I'm basically a Rose developer and uh, I have been working with Rose from 2010. And my main hobbies are like creating tutorials and I used to write books in Rose. So till now I have written eight books in Rose. Then I have a consulting company. So um, I used to uh, develop programs for the clients. Uh, I have some clients in the US and all. So currently I also uh, running a course in a robot operating system. It's like six to eight months course in roles. So that is also going. Yeah, that's it. That's it about myself. Yeah. Where are you based out of? Yeah, I'm, in, I'm from India, India. There is a state called Kerala. So yeah. Cool. So I know uh, Ross started uh, in Willow Garage I can't remember the date now, but uh, that's kind of where Ross uh, sort of began uh, and sort of taking off. Um, so can you kind of like go over what what Ross is? It's not really an operating system. It sits on top of Ubuntu. But can you kind of like go some of the little basics of what Ross is? Yeah, so the thing is that <clears throat> from the name itself, we may have some confusion, a robot operating system. So most of the people thinking like it may be an operating system, but it's not, but it is having some features of operating system, okay? So from the Rose website, they're saying it's a meta operating system, uh, meaning it is having some features of operating system, but it's not a real operating system. It need a host operating system to run. So basically what I'm seeing is uh, the main part of Rose is, uh, the middleware, the communication middleware. So the middleware is helping the user to communicate uh, between two programs in your computer, okay? So the middleware program is actually working between the operating system layer and the user application. So this middleware help you to create application that can able to communicate with each other, okay? So that is a, a fundamental part of ROSE, the communication middleware. Then it is also providing tools uh, for visualization and debugging. Then it is having capabilities. So that is very important because if you want to create an autonomous mobile robot from scratch, you can just uh, download some packages and configure. So uh, then the autonomous robot is ready. And also you can have perception, manipulation. Those things are some of the capabilities of Rose. And there is a big ecosystem around robot, robotic operating system. Uh, so you will get support from online communities and there are a lot of developers, ROS developers like me. So these are the things about ROS. Yeah, so the main thing is the communication middleware. Yes. Cool. So I, I've seen this online in some of the, 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 the ROS forums. It's kind of, maybe more of a joke, but they say, you uh, prototype in Python, and then you Q code your final stuff in C++. Does it really matter what programming language you use in ROS, or is it uh, for your packages? Yeah, the thing is that ROS offers some client libraries, okay? So the client libraries help to uh, use the ROS APIs that it provides, and uh, we can create ROS programs using these client libraries. So there are different client libraries available. So there is ROS CPP for programming uh, ROS using C++, and we have ROS Py, which is helping to program ROS uh, using Python. So uh, you can use any client libraries, but um, I think the ROS CPP is having full support, uh, full API support for ROS, but ROS Py uh, didn't have uh, full support. Okay, I mean, um, when we compared with raw CPP. So it's our choice, basically, uh, if you are good at Python, then you can start with Python. 
Uh, and if you're good at CPP, you can start with CPP. But in my course, I am starting with the CPP because most of the students know C, C and C++ a little, but Python, they are just starting. So if you, if you are planning to start with Python and rows, you should know Python better. It's easy to learn, but uh, regarding the object-oriented concept, those kind of st stuff should be very clear. So I will suggest to start with your convenient or comfortable programming language. Um, so for beginners, maybe, um, so if, if, the, if they are uh, aware of C programming language, then C++ will not be much uh, tough for them. And if they know Python better, then they can start with Python. So it's not, uh, I mean, uh, it's a, a, about the convenience uh, that that will I say, yeah. And yeah. sometimes the performance also, like if you are writing a vision based program, 3D point cloud, those kind of stuff, then C++ is the best because we can skew out all the performance. Um, you know, when we compare the performance between C++ application and Python, C++, I think it is having some lead over Python. So I will prefer uh, C++ in that scenario. And I also like uh, st ask students to start with C++ because that will give much uh, idea about rows, APIs and all. Then they can slowly migrate to Python because Python you can learn anytime. Uh, it's very easy to start, but sometimes if you want to switch to C++, then it will be difficult for Python developers. Okay, so start with C++ and maybe start parallelly working with Python. Yeah, that is my, yeah. Cool, cool. So <clears throat> I've seen a lot of, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of connected to social media. I've seen a lot of places and people advertising, take our Ross, Ross course, do this, this is how you get started. Do you have any guidelines? I mean, I know you have your own course that you do and you have your eight books, but is there, is there a really good pathway or a starting point for somebody who, who doesn't know anything about Ross? I mean, do they start at the, uh, the Wikipedia page, uh, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the Ross pages, or where, where's the best way to start? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. Um, so when we start with Rose, uh, we have some prerequisites to, to start with. Like uh, we know, uh, we need to know Ubuntu Linux. I mean, mainly Ubuntu uh, and Linux commands. So yeah. that is one prerequisite. Then uh, you may need to know C++ or Python and Git then, yeah. So these four uh, important prerequisites. So um, before starting this, you have to learn this. So if you, if you directly jump into a ROS course and if you don't know these things, then you will be in trouble. Okay, so you can't able to follow these programming uh, tutorials and all. So I will suggest you to start with the prerequisites. Then after, after understanding these uh, important concepts like object oriented concepts, then important Linux commands, then slowly work with uh, ROS. Um, maybe you can, uh, you can start with a book, ROS book, then a course or Rose Wiki. Um, so in the beginning, I will not suggest Rose Wiki because um, as Wikipedia, uh, like when we start reading Wikipedia, then you will have some other hyperlinks, then you will go to that hyperlink. So Rose Wiki is similar to that. Uh, I will say it's not designed for beginners. So I will suggest them to start with a beginner's course, a beginner's book of Rose. Uh, for example, uh, I have written a book called Rose for Absolute Beginners. So uh, what I did was I started with these prerequisites. So I started with Ubuntu, Python, C++, those kind of stuff. I have just covered, I mean, I, I can't cover all the aspect, uh, but I have covered the important things that we require to start with those. And I introduced ROS. So that is actually a, a better method according to me. And that help other people uh, because when they start with rows, these things should be satisfied. And uh, so if they follow this book, they will get a, uh, I mean, basic idea and start with rows. So this is one issue that I have seen in many courses. They will directly jump into rows concept. And when they start discussing the programming side, they will stuck, these uh, students will stuck and they have to go back uh, to these fundamentals. 
So that was one issue that I found. So that's why I started this course, uh, this uh, course that I'm running now. So I started with the fundamentals and after creating a strong foundation, I just introduced ROS and slowly uh, the ROS concept using this turtle sim. And uh, I have uh, um, assigned some projects to them. They are uh, working with some turtle sim projects. So after creating a good foundation in turtle sim, then I will slowly introduce other concepts. So it's actually a gradual progress rather than directly jumping into um, big concepts like navigation stack or uh, move it. Uh, we have to start from the scratch. I mean, from the prerequisites and slowly learn process. It's not a uh, quick process. It will take time. So you have to be patient, uh, like, like learning any other framework, it will take time. So that was my learning. Um, so I also having issues uh, while starting with Rose. It was very difficult for me. So I started in 2010, 11 time. So at that time, it's like Sea Turtle Diamond Black. That, uh, that was a version, Rose version. So the Rose Wiki was not uh, structured. Uh, it was still building. And uh, I have faced a lot of difficulty. Uh, and somehow I learned some concept of Rose. And I know that it was not perfect. And after learning each concept, I used to YouTube uh, those, uh, those learning. So maybe you can find some of my old VD tutorial that I have done in 2012, 13 time. And I used to blog these learnings in my uh, old blog. So this was the thing uh, that I have been doing in the beginning. So when you start teaching people with this concept, then we will also learn. And when we start writing these tutorials in our blog, we will also uh, learn some stuff. And from 2014, I started writing books. So I, uh, I, like when I write these books, I am also learning. I'm not like a rose wizard or something. While I am writing books, I am learning a lot of stuff. I'm writing a uh, lot of projects. Uh, I'm using some existing work and modifying them. So it's like a learning process for me, these books and also this course. So I'm still learning. Uh, I will say I'm still a student because there are a lot of changes uh, happen in Rose ecosystem. Uh, like Rose one is the Rose two, then a lot of packages. So still learning, um, still I'm learning from the students in my course. They are also introducing some new packages to me. So I'm keep on learning it, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I found the same thing. That's why I like doing these videos and talking to people because uh, trying to express myself and, and explain something to somebody, it's a, it, it, it kind of forces me to learn the, the subject better. And like you said, as a teacher, you're learning from the students and you learning new things. And by trying to express yourself and teach somebody else, you have a better understanding uh, of the subject you're talking about. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, yeah. So let's kind of, let's kind of jump into the ROS 1, ROS 2. Uh, can you kind of explain the development path and what's going on? Because I know there's a little bit of confusion right now. Which which should I use? Should I use ROS one right now or ROS two, or should I wait for a while to ROS two is fully developed? Kind of, can you kind of jump into the differences and what's going on between ROS one and ROS two? Yeah. So again, a good question. So the thing is that in my course, I started with ROS one. Uh, why? Because the concepts, the ROS concept that we are dealing with, ROS 1 and ROS 2 are almost the same, the concepts. And uh, the APIs uh, have changes and libraries have changes. But um, like we, when we learn programming language, we may be starting with C, right? C is the like a foundation programming language. So like that, I'm starting them with ROS 1. And after completing some concept in ROS1, main concept in ROS1, I slowly migrate to ROS2. I, I'm introducing the ROS2 concept and I'm showing them the packages like navigation stack, move it, these kind of thing using in ROS2. So they know both, both this world. And um, currently the thing is that ROS2 Fox is there and uh, a lot of packages are ported to ROS2. And I will suggest to have a look on to ROS1 first and slowly migrate to ROS2. That is uh, my suggestion because uh, this is like a transition phase. 
Um, so if you are a perfect uh, absolute beginner, you can just start with ROS1 because a lot of tutorials are still based on ROS1. And if you learn ROS1, you will get the concept, the ROS concept, this communication and all. Then after that, you can just have a look onto ROS2. And so the migration will not take much time. Uh, even I am learning uh, concepts in ROS2, uh, so I can relate. Like I have learned ROS1 and there are some concepts in ROS1. So there is a similarity in ROS2. So I can just compare and study. So this is what I'm doing. Uh, I mean, I'm also learning ROS2. I am teaching ROS2 for my uh, team, uh, course members. So this is uh, what I'm doing. And uh, the la last version of ROS1 is ROS Noitic and uh, it will stop support uh, I think in 2025. So till yeah. then, uh, yeah, till, uh, we will get the support. And I think uh, we can slowly migrate uh, maybe from next year also, like we can slowly migrate to ROS2. Um, but initially I will suggest them to start with ROS1 concept. Otherwise they will, uh, they will struggle. And I'm still have some issues or some um, I mean, doubts regarding this uh, DDS layer, uh, the data distribution service layer in ROS2, because there are a lot of players, there are a lot of companies offering this solution. And um, there are a lot of uh, uh, competition around it because there is commercial uh, DDS, there is free DDS. So people are still confused which DDS uh, should use. Uh, so um, maybe after uh, one year or something, like we will get a good DDS uh, that can uh, free uh, th that can be available for free. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of confusion uh, r related to ROS2, uh, but I'm also seeing a lot of uh, development in ROS2 uh, regarding porting of existing ROS1 packages to ROS2 that is also happening. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so yeah, slow slow migration is happening. Um, so maybe. Uh, if you are starting with ROS, I will suggest to have a look on to ROS1 first, then slowly understand ROS2. Both of the concepts are same. And uh, so, and I, I, uh, I also want to um, um, discuss an advantage of learning ROS1 and ROS2. Uh, imagine uh, you are working uh, for a project, okay? And you found a ROS1 package, and that is not a port to ROS2, okay? okay. And so if you know ROS1, then you can easily port this ROS1 package to ROS2. But if you only know ROS2, then you will start at that time. So these are the advantages because from 2020 to 25, I'm seeing this migration from ROS1 to ROS2. So if you know this two world, then the migration will be very easier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, the uh, so I really I, I I need to plug your book <clears throat> from beginner to Ross yeah, beginner to Ross book. I've read that. That's a really good book. It teaches okay. a lot of yeah. fundamentals, like you were talking about. Uh, so I would encourage somebody if they're just getting started to start with your book. Uh, and yeah, I I I looked through the Wikipedia. I navigated through Wikipedia for Ross. And you can get kind of confused. You can kind of get lost. And if you don't know the basic concepts, uh, I, I, yeah, the Wikipedia may not be very helpful for you. So yeah, uh, yes, great points. Yes, I agree with agree with that. Um, so uh, there's different ways. So let me kind of get into the how to sort of implement uh, implementation, like. One of the, well, let me take one step back. I need to mention for beginners, if you don't have a Raspberry Pi, I would definitely uh, recommend that uh, you get a Raspberry Pi uh, and learn the ins and outs of Ubuntu. Uh, like you were saying, start out there. You can also program in Python and C++ in there. And do you can do OpenCV and other co kind of cool stuff to kind of get a foundation for you. And then once you jump into ROS, you can actually uh, uh, use the Raspberry Pi uh, uh, to control like the TurtleBot 3 for Robotis. Uh, so when you're learning ROS, uh, do you recommend 
having a physical robot or is a gazebo enough for a uh, for a student uh, to uh, well some people can't afford a robot so gazebo may be their only uh, avenue but do you do you do you think the virtual online stuff is the best way to learn how to program a robot uh, using ross or do you need a physical robot yeah again a good question because um Again, like when we start with Rose, we may not have a physical robot with us, but uh, I will say like when we start learning the concept, um, at that time, we may not need a real hardware. But uh, for example, uh, if you are learning the concepts like Rose topic, Rose messages, Rose action, those kind of stuff, like understanding the Rose middleware, uh, the, the communication, then you can use maybe the turtle sim simulator the turtle sim, uh, you can uh, just write programs and uh, understand how these roles uh, framework works. Then maybe you can uh, slowly start working with the gazebo simulator, again, an extension uh, or a um, advanced simulator, 3D simulator. So you can just play with it. And uh, after that, you can try um, working with the hardware. So. If you, if you check the robot development, the first thing is that, for example, if I'm doing a project for uh, my client, um, uh, uh, it may be a, a physical robot, creating a physical robot, then what will I do is I will collect the requirements, then I will design, then I will 3D uh, model the robot, then I will do a simulation, then after the simulation, we will do the hardware. So like that, if they can learn the concept from TurtleSim, then uh, implement um, their application using simulation, then slowly working with the hardware. Um, I think that is one approach that I am, uh, I mean, in, uh, implementing in my course also. Um, but the other way that is um, having a, a real robot with you and starting with that also work fine. But at that time, I think um, regarding, I mean, yeah, that is also fine. Both are fine. It's uh, if you have a real robot, you can also start. For example, if you have a real turtle board two or three with you, then you can start um, learning rows by working on the real platform. So both are fine. Both are fine. Uh, if you have the real hardware, just uh, start working with rows using that, otherwise you can start working with this turtle sim or gazebo. And, but if you are going to prototype a new robot, I will suggest it after the simulation freeze. So if you are like creating a new robot or something, then I will suggest it after the simulation phase, after getting some understanding about rows and all. But if you want to learn rows, I think simulation or real hardware will work, anything, fine, yeah. Okay, cool. So. <clears throat> now, so I, I'm just curious about your opinions on this. So uh, Amazon through AWS has been doing a lot of work uh, with, uh, with the RoboMaker and uh, trying to connect, uh, because it basically runs Ross under, underneath of it. And you have, so, so for somebody who doesn't have a, a Ubuntu a laptop or computer running Ubuntu, you can, uh, 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 have basically have a server of uh, running Ubuntu for you. So you can do, you, you do your development through RoboMaker. It also helps you with versioning and like you have lots, lots of uh, programmers working on the same robot. Uh, they, can, they can do on their machine, they can do some development and then they can merge it and stuff. Um, so what, what's your thoughts on AWS RoboMaker? I know that's a general yeah. question, but yeah, yeah. Do you have any experience with it? And then what do you think about it? Yeah, so um, regarding AWS, uh, you know, uh, they are providing a lot of services. Like we can, uh, we can create uh, some, um, I mean, VM, uh, VM, I mean, virtual box, not virtual box. It's the um, um, computational instance. We can create instance. Then we can do a lot of stuff with AWS. So I think they have added these uh, robotics along with that. And um, so if you think about uh, a product or if you th think about a uh, robot fleet, imagine in a warehouse or something, then you may need some kind of cloud-based solution 
uh, like for fleet management or if you want to simulate some scenario uh, like um, in gazebo or something uh, at that time maybe aws uh, will uh, will be useful but uh, i have a confusion in the pricing um, uh, i didn't i didn't um, i mean extensively use aws but i just had a look on to that but i have some issues with the pricing uh, i think the pricing is high for example uh, if some people started to learn aws robomaker they are not providing any trial option um, i think they are not providing any trial option so that will be difficult for beginners so that is one issue that i have seen with aws robomaker but if you are checking the construct the construct they are like they have a free account so you can oh, just yeah, have yeah. a yeah they uh, but i'm not sure uh, they will continue that they are slowly uh, converting into paid options so um but at least we can try it in uh, in construct but in aws i think they are not providing that and uh, when we compare the construct and robomaker i think the robomaker having more um i mean power to expand for example if you want to add a fleet management system in your robot and um, if you want to control a swarm of robot uh, from the cloud i think aws uh, will do the job and you can also do the simulation um, so if you want to do a uh, i mean big simulation like warehouse management uh, or self driving car simulation uh, i think those can be possible in robomaker without expanding our infrastructure because you know buying uh, the gpus uh, and buying a new workstation for this purpose is expensive but uh, if we can simply do this in the cloud um, then that will be that will be good but i'm not uh, sure about the pricing so if the pricing is too high then uh, we can think about adding an infrastructure in our side um, and maybe we can for for the fleet management and all we can create a uh easy to instance in aws and uh do the stuff in in that so we don't need the aws robot maker so i think it all depends on the pricing okay so if the pricing is affordable then we can think about um i mean planning everything in the cloud um mm -hmm. yeah so that is my take on aws robot maker it's good so far um and i have seen a lot of development in the aws storm maker and they also contributing a lot of things in the open source community um so they're doing good uh, but i have a take on this pricing so at least they have to provide some trial options to start with and uh, yeah uh, then if the pricing is affordable then more there will be more users yeah <clears throat> yeah so yeah it's construct that's the other uh they have a lot of uh, videos and web-based uh, uh, instructions and stuff on Ross. That's another really good place. Yeah, I forgot. I should have mentioned them sooner. Yeah, they're also a really good place to start. I know they have some entry-level stuff like you're talking about for Ubuntu and programming and so on. Uh, they have YouTube videos and courses that you can take. And some of them, the entry-level stuff is free. So yeah, that, that's another really good place to start. Um, so I think- But uh, there, there is another things to say, I forgot to mention. So the problem is um, when I talk with students, uh, they started with Construct. The problem is that uh, they are getting a virtual um, environment to work with, right? A cloud-based uh, solution they are providing. So they will be confusing. They have confusion like Rose is an IDE or something or Rose is this or I mean, initially when we start with Rose, uh, then I will not recommend Construct because oh. we will have confusion because we have to start with the, the bare metal stuff. Like we have to install Ubuntu, then we have to install Rose and we can learn stuff. And I will recommend Construct for the projects. So they have a thing called Rose Jex. Uh, which is having like hosting your project and for demonstration, you can just host your project in their uh, repository and you can just share the links and all. So uh, I'm seeing a good scope with that stuff. But when we start learning rows with um, uh, this um, construct, then they will be having confusion because 
as I mentioned, uh, they are providing a, a single window with a lot of ID. I, I, there is an ID, there is a simulator, there is a shell. So I think uh, beginners will have so many issues. And also when we check the free content that they are providing, they have some documentation. Um, I'm not sure that is enough for a beginner because um, most of the people are not aware of uh, a, a Python uh, C++. So they are giving some tutorials, uh, assuming that these guys know something, okay? Uh, but they have, uh, I mean, when we go through the tutorial, maybe we can just copy paste those command and that will work, but that is not enough to start with rows. Okay, so from my experience, that, uh, that is the case. And they are also providing some paid course. Uh, I mean, they have um, small, small uh, modules, but I, I'm assuming that if we have some rose learning, rose uh, understanding, rose knowledge, then those course may help because uh, we, can, we can clearly understand this is actually happening in Ubuntu ecosystem and uh, uh, the, the things that is running on this virtual platform can be run on Ubuntu. Uh, so if you have a clear understanding about that, then it's fine. Otherwise, it may create some confusion. Even though they are providing a lot of tutorials, um, th they are using uh, their own platform for, for, uh, for, for working with uh, the rows. Uh, so there is there will have some confusion when we start with that. They're contributing a lot of things to, uh, for this uh, Rose uh, ecosystem. That is great. Uh, but if that is simply for promoting their um, platform, uh, I don't have any take on that. Uh, but if they are, I mean, really contributing to, to the uh, ecosystem, then it will be great. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a thing. Yeah. Very cool. So I, I think kind of to sum up, I think what you're saying is, is that somebody trying to get into uh, ROS or ROS is they need to know the fundamentals. Uh, like they need to have Ubuntu, you know how to do command lines, how to manipulate Ubuntu or whatever the, their distribution they're using. They need to know C++ uh, or in Python really well. They need to know how to, the programming language, you like object oriented, they need to know how to write programs and all that. So they need lots of fundamentals. And then once they get that, I think what you're saying is that they need to have a, hopefully have a laptop or computer that has running like Ubuntu. They need yes. to install ROS. They need to see everything from the beginning, ground up. They need yes. to install ROS. They need to know how to use ROS. Uh, uh, like I said, Raspberry Pi may be a good, uh, good way for somebody exactly. who's having budget issues to slowly work their way up. And then once they've got a lot of the fundamentals, understanding the fundamentals, then the Wiki, uh, Wikipedia page construct or AWS would be the next step. So yeah, that exactly. makes sense. I, yeah. I like that. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. good. And and I and I I do like your introduction to beginners beginners to Ross book. Uh, uh, I definitely, uh, at least for now, it sounds like uh, Ross one is where everybody should start. Uh, and like your book would be great. And once they get all the fundamentals down, then they can easily transition to Ross too. So yeah. 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 And, and I also have a take on uh, how to start with Ross. Um, if you have a personal instructor, I mean, maybe it's maybe a friend or it may be your uh, professor or something, then I will prefer that option more than starting with uh, the books or course. Because um, I think if we if we get help, uh, some help from uh, some of our personal uh, contacts, some uh, maybe friends or professors, then it will help to start with rows very easily. Okay, so a personal instructor, a friend, or something, it will be good to get started. Um, so yeah, that is another thing. Cool. That yeah, that's that's a good that's a good uh, that's a good point. That uh, being able to ask somebody. Uh, questions and say, oh, I'm stuck on this and they can help you. Uh, yeah, that's definitely, uh, I, for a lot of stuff, uh, I, it's like 3D printing and robotics, uh, always like ask questions, even as your teacher, ask questions, like you were saying before, uh, you're learning too. So yes, I like that mentor. Uh, Mentorship, of, yeah. 
mentorship, yeah. So initially, if we have initially if we have that mentorship, then we can uh, accelerate our uh, I mean uh, learning in rows. Then slowly we can use these answers dot rows dot org or some um, Stack Overflow to get help. But the initial traction uh, will be like it it will be accelerating through this uh, mentorship. So that is also important, um, yeah, from my experience. Very cool. Uh, so what, do you have any, uh, you may not have, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, but uh, do you have any predictions about Ross? Is Ross gonna get bigger and bigger? Is Ross gonna kind of dominate uh, robotics uh, uh, in the next, uh, well, like, like I said, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you is because I talked to a lot of high school students and college students who are interested in robotics. And, that, and they, they're kind of asking, how do I get into it? How do I get involved? And usually after a while, the conversation develops. We talk to talk more. Then I bring up the topic of Ross. Uh, and then they're like, oh, what is that? Um, do, you, do you see? the importance of Ross becoming greater and greater and it is, and uh, is that if you were, if you were mentoring or talking to a group of uh, uh, students who are interested in robotics, would you tell them that Ross is, is a good place to, to maybe not jump in or the fundamentals, but eventually they should do, uh, get involved with Ross? Yeah, so initially I, I would like to say that Ross is just a tool to start uh, do, um, robot programming, okay? So if you take MATLAB or Octave or any other tool, uh, you can do some maybe robot programming use, using that tool. So ROSE is just another tool to do uh, robot programming, okay? So ROSE is not everything, it's just a tool. And at any time, there will be a new tool can come, okay? With more features or something. But the advantage of uh, uh, Rose, uh, Rose framework is that they started in 2007, okay? So earlier, uh, I mean, those who started earlier, they will, they will have some advantages, right? So these guys are having that advantages. And uh, if, you, if you talk about Rose one, that actually designed for research purpose, okay? And Rose one is maintaining up to 2022, 25. And ROS2 is, is having more features, more power, uh, more power. So if we if we planning to deploy some ROS application in a product, then we have to use ROS2. Okay, so ROS2 is just started, right? So similar to that, someone can invent a new framework. Okay, they can implement all the features of this ROS2 and they can come up with a new framework. Okay, uh, recently uh, NVIDIA is having Isaac SDK. Isaac SDK is having good simulation. And uh, the only thing is that they, uh, it need their own uh, board like Xavier or NVIDIA board uh, should be right. a mandatory thing. So maybe these big companies can come up with a framework that can beat Rose anytime, okay? Uh, because of this open source nature and um, because of this legacy, uh, Rose is having a lot of advantages. So I'm not believing that Rose is everything, uh, but currently Rose is having a lot of popularity, a lot of support, uh, a lot of tools, uh, those kind of things. So maybe we can start with Rose, but some point of time, there will be a new framework that will be much better than Rose and maybe uh, it may be open source. So maybe we have to slowly migrate to that framework. Okay, so it all depends on our requirement. Like uh, for example, in my case, if I am uh, doing a project for a client um, and if the client wants a simulation, so initially I was suggesting Gazebo, but now we have a lot of options. Like we have web boards, we have VRAP. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, better simulation option. And even I, <clears throat> sorry, Isaac SDK, uh, they are also providing a simulation. So, um, so it's all depend on our application, and I I will uh, I, I will say new framework will come. Um, so if the Rose framework is successful, then by seeing this success, maybe some other framework can also come, because Rose is mainly about this uh, communication in uh, in the process communication. 
So I think there is a good chance of coming a uh, new framework. So we have to adapt to it. So that's my take. So I'm not, uh, I mean, strictly sticking on to rows. I am, at, uh, I'm open to changes. So if there is new platform comes, I will explore it and I will work for it. Yeah, but uh, from 2010, uh, the time that I started working to 2020, there is no new uh, frameworks uh, um, like Rose. Okay, uh, that is uh, more, um, I mean, better than Rose. So that's why I'm sticking to Rose. And I, I, re I really like this framework, actually. Uh, it's uh, very interesting. So, so that's why I'm still stick on to ROS framework. Yes, cool. Yeah, so yeah, uh, NVIDIA and their Jetson boards and they have an SDK. So yeah, that's something else if somebody was interested in doing robotics, they're doing a lot of development, spending a lot of money on, uh, yes. uh, uh, especially vision. Uh, yes. yes. Cool. Uh, yes, I, I agree with you. It seems like uh, a lot of people, when I, when I talk to people in the know, uh, they're really looking forward to uh, ROS2. Uh, they're, they're maybe not doing a lot of development ROS2, but they're all looking forward to ROS2 and the possibilities uh, uh, of ROS2. And like you saying, ROS1 is more for research and development. ROS2 is more for the finished product, uh, your yes. robot fleet. So yes, I've heard that from uh, many people on the, and it, they're really looking forward to the possibilities of what will happen. Uh, with Ross too. But I also want to backtrack and say that one of the great, one of the good things about Ross uh, is the open source environment it's in, uh, how there's a lot of sharing, uh, how there's a lot of packages and development has already been done that you could go out and you can leverage that. You may have to adapt it for your robot or for what your situation is, but there's a lot of really good foundation out there so that you can just take a robot, like you said, uh, and uh, quickly uh, uh, get it up and working. Now you may have to fine tune it and adjust it uh, and for your environment, what you're doing, but there's a lot of really good stuff out there right now because of the open source nature of what Ross is. Yeah, and you know, there is um, a possibility to come another framework, as I mentioned. For example, if you heard about ASIM, ASIM, which is a simulator from uh, Microsoft. That is an uh, open source uh, simulator. So these big companies can come up with a big framework uh, than ROS anytime, and they can make that open source. So this can happen anytime. So we have to adapt, yeah. Okay, very cool. Um, I think you've done a great job of answering most of my questions. Uh, I don't know if we really need to get in depth and you know into how to do everything in ROS and get really technical. This is like more of an introduction. Is there um, is there any uh, topics that I, I missed or something that uh, you're interested in about ROS or something you want to add? Uh, I think we have covered most of the stuff. Mainly, um, the important thing is how to get started with ROS and. Uh, the uh, I think we miss the opportunities. Oh, uh, that is the thing. Opportunities like wh what will we get if we start working with ROS? Like job opportunities, research opportunities. I think maybe I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, so if you just search for, um, I mean, ROS uh, or robotic software engineers in, in any of the job website, you can find ROS as a requirement. Okay, so these guys, most of the startups and even big companies uh, are using ROS. Um, and also in research, they are using uh, ROS extensively. Uh, I have worked with Carnegie Mellon University for a while. So um, I have, uh, I mean, talked to a lot of people in that lab and most of the people are using ROS, ROS. So I'm seeing a lot of, I mean, opportunities if you, if you learn ROS. Um, regarding um, this job opportunities, research opportunities, and also like educator, you can be an educator. So for example, uh, when AWS RoboMaker starts, they actually mailed me to create a course based on AWS RoboMaker. 
So uh, I think they have referred uh, my books and uh, that's why they have contacted me. But at that time I was busy with some project, I guess. So they uh, need educators. I mean, uh, obviously uh, there is a scope for educa educators. So these are the scopes that I'm seeing in research, in um, companies, like, I mean, a lot of companies require uh, Rose um, knowledge and uh, as a role as educator. Um, so there are a lot of possibilities now. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so I, I think we did a really good job of in introduction. Um, I just have some side notes. Have you, lately I've been talking to a lot of my friends about some developments in the robotic world. And you, you don't have to have an opinion on these things, but uh, the big thing was Boston Dynamics being bought out by uh, 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 Hyundai. Have you heard, did you, did you hear about that? Because uh, BD is being bought by Hyundai. Uh, I don't know if you've heard that, but uh, they sold in almost a billion dollars on uh, the acquisition. So Hyundai, the, the, the South Korean uh, car company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah. Uh huh huh. I think I have read somewhere. Yeah. I mean, so, so uh, yeah. 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 Uh, um, so if you check the history of Boston Dynamics, they are acquiring by several companies, right? Um, I think before acquiring by Google, they have acquired by I think SoftBank or something. I'm not sure. So um, I'm not sure uh, about the future of Boston Dynamics. Uh, they are still acquiring by companies by companies. So uh, no idea, but currently they are doing a good job. I mean, sport is now an official uh, a product now in the market. Right. So they're doing great. I had an opportunity to talk personally with the um, CEO of Boston Dynamics in CMU. So what he's doing is that he's very passionate on robotics and these kind of um, biped robots, those kind of stuff, uh, mainly in robot dynamics. So he... Uh, he will uh, keep on doing this stuff because that is his passion. And uh, maybe the outcome of his research uh, will take some time to, to convert it as a product. Currently, it's actually converted as a product. So these guys are working uh, with robotics, I think maybe more than 10 years ago, uh, they just started and working. So the outcome, uh, like as a product, actually, uh, it's actually came now. Right. So it, it is taking a lot of time. So a lot of money, of course. And in the meantime, they are also acquired by several companies. But I think they are uh, stick on to the quality of research. So that's the thing that I really like. They are doing great stuff. So I am also a great fan of uh, Boston Dynamics because of this um, great research. Uh, but I'm not sure, like maybe if they are planning another company is planning for acquiring a Boston Dynamics. I'm not sure about the future, but still right. uh, from my understanding, they will stick on to the core research. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cause I think I saw on your social media that you, that you have some, that's the reason why I asked the question. Cause I think I yeah. seen you post a picture or something talking to people from Boston and Dynamics. Yeah. So Hyundai, uh, it looks like the South Korean company, uh, car company Hyundai is going to buy Boston Dynamics. It's almost a billion dollars uh, purchased from SoftBank. Uh, it looks like that's going to go through. And it seems like Hyundai is really uh, uh, into uh, robotics and developing robotics. And they think it's going to be uh, like a 20, 25% uh, of their company is going to be robotics development in the future is what the, I've seen articles about it. So cool, cool, yep. cool. Yep. Um, so I think, cool. So I think that's pretty much it. Uh, uh, this has been a great talk. Uh, I, kinda, I really enjoyed it. Uh, um, like I said, I will, when I post this, uh, I'll put up links to some of your videos and I think to your, to your eight books uh, and to Construct and to AWS and to the uh, uh, Ross Wiki um, for people to check out and check the links. So cool. So I, I mean, Unless you have anything else that you want to add, I think uh, I think we might be good here. So, uh, not much, not much. I think we have discussed almost all the stuff. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I I want to thank you again for your time and. Uh,
you know. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. See everybody next time. Yeah.